Hello everyone. I am Steve, breaker of large things at Hawthorne Works. And I'm here to talk about the secrets of yarn application development. I've been doing some of this myself, and these are, these are some of the lessons I've learned. Before I start, hands up who's heard of yarn at all. Hands up who's heard what it is. OK, keep your hands up if you've actually coded applications specifically for it. OK, those are the hecklers right over there. Okay. I, will, I will maybe accept questions from you, but I'm a bit hungover, so don't shout them too much, OK? <laughs> all anyway, right, this is me. Back in the beginning, there was Hadoop and there was MapReduce. And it was incredibly successful because it, it made writing distributed applications easier. For the first time, you didn't have to understand all the problems. You just wrote a mapper and reducer, and it worked. Well, it worked provided your code was either a map or a reducer. But as the amount of data the cluster collected got bigger and bigger, other people in the organization wanted to run their code on it too. And the only way you could do this was by having your code pretend to be a map or a reducer with a, a hack known as the long-lived mapper, where you'd start a map reduce job that would never, ever finish. It was an ugly hack that just about got things to work, it, but it had bad failure modes. You couldn't really expand it on demand or shrink or, and, or choose where things would be. It would just be where your data was or random. And the ops teams hate it too. That job tracker, it just wasn't designed for long-lived code. It couldn't deal with the scale and failure. So it was, it was an ugly hack. So along, along comes a solution. Yarn, yet another resource negotiator. And its aim in life is to let you run other, other algorithms alongside MapReduce. So MapReduce is there. It still runs happily. We try and run existing code. But we also, you can run other code there, and now there are projects actually building the other tools to go alongside. So if you view Hadoop as a kind of data center, le data center level OS, Yarn, Yarn is part of the execution engine. Right down the bottom, there's almost a device driver level of the host OS and the networking stuff. You don't need to understand the details. You don't need to look at Linux device driver internals. But it's kind of handy to have a vague idea of what's going on. Same for networking. HGFS, you can go back and read the original papers from the early 80s on Jupyter Computing. You don't really care about that. All you care about is it's very cost effective to store lots of data, and it can come in remotely. So Yarn's the same thing. We've been trying, well, my colleagues have been working on something that lets you run your code within a Hadoop cluster. It deals with the problem of getting the binaries to the machines to run the stuff, to keep track of the health. And you, you can focus on the layers above. You can decide what you want to run, where you want to run it, how failures happen. So I like to view this as kind of the Lamport layer. You work at this, you have to go and read Lamport's papers and then run away screaming. You really want to focus at this level above, the algorithms. And even if you can, the really high levels, because ultimately, you're trying to do useful work. You know, and MapReduce worked really well because it hid all the complexity, all the stuff down below, and said mappers and reducers. And that's, that's what everything should be thinking about here, is what can they do in terms of more reusable systems like this? How can you do it inside Yarn? And just generally get your work done with the petabytes of data you're collecting. So Yarn, it runs the code across the cluster. Somewhere in there, there's a resource manager, one of them, or now there's two of them, now we've got HA. And on each machine in your cluster, you have something called a node manager. It talks to the resource manager, says it's there, and it manages these things called containers. And a container is really currently a C group managed execution kind of process tree of code that you're running. We're playing with Docker a bit. And the containers are the code that Yarn tells it to run. The resource manager decides what's going to run where, tells the node managers, they run it. And something happens here. Yarn gets told about it again, the resource manager, and it gets to deal with it. The way it works is your code, your code talks to Yarn and say, I want to run something. 
And you run something called the Application Master. Um, it's worth noting we have a whole new set of acronyms here. If you thought you understood about data node and name node and task tracker, you've got more to learn. So the Application Master is effectively the successor to the job tracker. It's your own personal job tracker to run your code with your algorithms and your policies. So all you're doing is tell Yarn to say, schedule your application somewhere, deploy this. Yarn will deploy it. It will keep an eye on it. If it fails, it'll restart it somewhere else based on the policy. And it just, it's, it's your code to make your decisions about what you're going to do. How do you run this? Well, the thing is, what we're doing there is we are running a remote application in a cluster. And what we have to do is tell Yarn what to do. This is something, if you end up staring at the code, you'll discover these called a container launch context. But the key point is, is that you, you just build up a command to run. You say, oh yeah, here are my environment variables I want set up. Here is my bash command line. And here are some files I want you to download. And that's basically it. So you tell Yarn, say, download these binaries, untile them if need be, run this command with this environment variable, and it goes away and running. There's some extra things that get passed down, various environment variables and stuff, to let your running application bind bind to Yarn, bind to the file system, pick up things like Kerberos keys. But generally, generally that's it. So you can run arbitrary code there. It does not have to be Java. Okay. The Yarn code, we help you do that, but you can run other bits of code in there. I've done Groovy ones, I've done Scala ones, which are the same JVM. But also people have done them in Go as well, actually. So it, it's really, it is a scheduler of arbitrary applications. One of the cute things is, you know, where do your binaries come from? And the answer is, you copy all the artifacts you actually want to run into HDFS or any other file system that Hadoop can grab. Here's an example here where I'm basically saying I want to download an HBase tarball somewhere, and I just say, right, you're going to download my HBase tar, but we're going to pick it up actually from an Amazon S3 URL. It's a URL that your code can that Hadoop can handle, and it will it will quite happily do this. And that's worth knowing if you're, say, playing with Yarn on an Amazon EMR cluster, is you can keep all your binaries somewhere just on S3 and pull them down on demand. Anyway, so I say, here's a tarball. I say, it's an archive which tells the node manager when this thing gets installed, untar it, unzip it, whatever. And I also give the relative path. I say, in install this into libhbase. What that means is when my container comes up, it's going to be untarred and then stuck in the relative path of somewhere, somewhere in the local file system. Node manager, when it's, it gets told to launch a container, it gets that list of resources there, pulls them all down, expands them, copies them, whatever, and then it does it into a bit of the file system that gets deleted once your container finishes, and then execs your bash command line at the base of that path. So now that I've installed hbase into libhbase, if I set my bash command to be libhbase slash hbase 0.98 slash hbase, it would actually exec hbase. And that's the secret, is you download your binaries, you set the environment variable, and you run your code. That is the core concept. There's one little surprise there called class paths. Okay, I won't go into details except to say it hurts. Uh, I will go into details, actually. It does hurt. The, there is, if you're running Java code, you want to set the class path of what to do. It makes sense to use the version of Hadoop and other binaries that are on the system at the far end, which you can't necessarily predict on your client because it's somebody else's cluster. So there's an environment variable, yarn application class path, that you should be able to grab from your yarn settings, site settings, to say, here's my class path. The default one says use the big top path, but different installations behave differently. You build your class path from that. If it's wrong, your application doesn't start with a relatively meaningless error message. It says class not found or something like that. So it's, it's actually one of the, the bigger sources of pain. You've got that little problem. There's another one, which is that that class path tends to include everything that Hadoop decides you want. That comes down to the version of log4j you want, the version of Jackson you want, whatever the Avro's in there. You get all the transient cruft on the class path, which 
due to an urge not to break things when we shipped Hadoop last year, Hadoop 2.2, is pretty out of date. And that, that means you really ought to be aware of what you're building against and kind of keep the old code. The good news is, it's been annoying me so much if I write my own code, I've just been upgrading the jars as I go along. So that's where I abuse my power. So Hadoop 9991 is a Jira to say, let's update everything. And we've done that as much as we can now. We've reached the impasse. We said, we are stuck with the latest versions of the binaries we can do that still run on Java 6. We want to get rid of that too. And generally work. The thing we're scared of is Google Guava. That's incredibly brittle. But you're going to have to deal with that for now, I'm afraid. I would like someone and that's particularly someone in the audience over there, is that Stefan over there? To go and add OSGI support for us instead, so we can run Yarn, run yarn apps in an OSGI container. That will make life a lot simpler. I think everybody agrees that, it's just nobody sat down to put in the hours, I'm afraid. Anyway, ignoring that little detail, your application master comes up and running. And what does it do? It's like the job tracker. Its aim in life is now to manage the work doesn't do the work so much as coordinate it. It says, it works out, it decides what it has to do based on your request or whatever, talks to Yarn and says, okay, I need some containers to do the actual work. It can specify the capacity, the amount of memory and CPU those containers have. It can say where you want them to be. And it builds up the binaries and executes it. It's also somewhere you can provide IPC and REST API calls web UIs, and it has to handle the responsibility of dealing with failures. A little bit of work on the side. So it, it's like it is exactly your version of the job tracker. In Hadoop 2, the job tracker replacement is a Yarn AM. It has all these features, and it, other applications do exactly the same thing. We ask for containers. All we do is say your requirements in terms of memory and CPU. And you also get to say where you want them. So MapReduce, it says, it looks at where the data is. Because here's my data sources. Looks at the files, looks at where the blocks are, which you can ask HDFS for, and then says, I want to run my code near here. In the project I've been working on, something called Slider, we do it completely differently. We just say, I want something at random. We don't really care where it is at first. But then we try and remember where it is, so the next time your application comes up, it came back in the same place it was. That's so we can reuse the data. And we just say, you know, we try and remember, but it's best effort. There's a little flag here saying, relax locality versus strict. Strict says it must be on a specific container. Relax says, oh, I'd like it. If you ask for strict and the machine's not there, you're not, you're not going to get a container. If that machine's busy, you're not going to get it. So generally, relax is the only option that makes sense. Now, one of the things you, also, you, you ask for this, and you get back something that may be what you wanted, or it may be close. One of the things that we've been working on, we've got to improve is our failure tracking. If something fails, what do we do in that, that world? Can we say, when we get it back, we don't want it? Do we list everything else and say, I, I want everything but these nodes? And it's, it's an interesting area for, for more code, at least in my project. But it, if you look at the big map reduce engines, job tracker and that, they have a nice simple notion of blacklisting. Say, this is machine is too slow. I'm not going to use it. I think we're, we're being a bit more subtle about it as we're trying to keep moving averages. And rather than just say a, a box works or doesn't work, we have a notion of this box is a bit unreliable. And you don't want to use it, but you have no other choice you might as well take it. In a small cluster, don't sit there saying, oh no, these things are no good. You want to say, well, I hate it, but I'll use it anyway. Anyway, so the application master, it asks Yarn for containers, what you want, maybe where you want it, and eventually, eventually that gets satisfied. You get some containers, and it becomes up to your code. You, you, you get them back, and you run them. And it's exactly that same setup as for an application master, where you say, here's my environment variable, here are my binaries, here's my, here's my command line, and you run them. Again, they start off in there. If you take the switches, you get C group isolation here. That's a subset of what things like Docker does. It doesn't hide the, the OS and the file system. 
but it does put limits on process and you know, CPU and memory consumption. And the policy there is if you, are, if you start using more memory than allowed, your program gets killed. CPU gets throttled. And that's, that's a nice way of stopping your application going wild in a cluster. And that, what that does is then let you, you can run your programs in a cluster without the ops team getting too unhappy. You know, you're not going to kill the thing's memory. We're not doing I.O. throttling yet, and that's an interesting problem, because the I.O. is actually going here in HGFS, not the container. So we've got to come up with some plan for dealing with that. But otherwise, your containers run relatively isolated. There is also a project underway running the containers in Docker. So you will just say, run these Docker images around the cluster. That gives you better isolation, although it complicates your networking setup. Anyway, so that's it. You run your containers. Now, what happens if something fails? A node goes away. That is something that is not directly your problem. It happens. It happens the larger the cluster is, just based on machine failures. Disk failures are kind of proportional to the number of disks you have. And then there's the risk that the code fails as well. The most unreliable piece of code in the Hadoop cluster is likely to be your own application. Right? So sometimes your containers crash. They fail. No matter what happens, whether the entire machine goes away or just your process exits, Jan finds out about it. Your process exits, the node manager says, that process died. Entire machine fails, Jan says, hang on, this thing here hasn't heartbeated in for a while, so let, let's assume it's dead. Again, the RM says it's dead. Either way, your application master gets told what, what happens, and it chooses how to react to it. I think for us, the slider stuff, we just ask for replacement. But that's, that's now policy-driven. If you look at things like the job tracker, they try and add some extra things to say, this bit of data we're working on caused the failure. They also look at the machine as well and do blacklisting. But you could imagine an application that says, if any machine fails, if any container fails, then I just die completely and roll back. And that may seem a stupid policy, but for some applications, it actually makes a lot of sense. So some of the people doing MPI over Yarn, a project called Hamster, I believe they do that. They basically say, I'm going to run a job. Anything happens to it, we'll stop and restart. And they rely on the fact that actually, if your job is fast enough or short-lived enough, you don't need to bother with checkpointing and restart is a f good failure mode. And if you don't save things to disk, you can actually get by a lot faster. So they're cheating and saying, actually, our failure policy is start from scratch. So don't, don't dismiss the simple policies. The other thing I'd recommend is don't forget model view controller as your architecture for an application. This is very important because most people writing Yarn applications start with an example piece of code called distributed shell in the Hadoop code base. And whoever wrote it forgot about model view controller. So you cut and paste that code, you start running with it, and your code gets a bit messy. And then you add a bit more stuff like failure handling and it gets a bit messy, and you end up with a class here that's about 8,000 lines long with all these various data structures in and synchronized blocks, and you have no idea what's happening. Then you spend a week, maybe even 10 days, stripping it all out and putting it in two places. Unless you like doing that, I'd say start from the beginning and come up with a model of what you're doing. And that's, in a Yarn application, that piece of code becomes your model of the cluster what's happening in the nodes, what their failure rate is, that kind of thing, and what you actually want to do. So for our code, we basically you take a specification saying, I want to run this binary, like HBase, on these machines. That's the specification. We ask for it, and then we keep track of where things are. And we have, we have some other stats there and what's going on, and a bit of knowledge of what we're doing. But it's all isolated, and that lets us do a few things, one of the best things is we can now test it heavily and simulate scale and failure handling without actually putting it on a real cluster. So even though I have access to big clusters, I have to argue with people to get that time. Here I can just say, right, I'm going to simulate a 10,000 node cluster. 
with some mock code that generates the requests and the failures and tries to even simulate kind of asynchronous calls into it, just, just to stress the code and to find those failures before you go into production. And that's important because when you get into the big distributed system, you're into the world of distributed debugging. And it is a lot easier to find the things on your local machine first. So do that, model view controller. The other thing is, is that you can add APIs on top. For us, we're hooking into, we have a REST API, an RPC API, and some Zookeeper stuff. On the side here is some chatting going on with Yarn itself, the resource manager, and then the node manager. That's all handled for us by classes that, that come in Yarn. So we, we just subclass something that handles all that conversation. This extra stuff we added on ourselves. Again, I think we got a bit too late to splitting it up. So this, this application master class is just over large. And it's become the piece of code we're scared of the most. So when we added the rest stuff, we at least did, did it slightly better and stuck it on the side. One thing we are doing now, we've got a separate model, is we're trying to do something which is very leading edge, which is handle failures of the application master itself. Until now, Yarn hopes that your application keeps running. If it fails, your if your application master fails, then all your containers get destroyed. Your application gets queued for restart, and Yarn keeps track of the fact your code failed. If it has not failed more than the cluster policy says fail is allowed, it'll get restarted somewhere else eventually when there's space on the cluster, and you have to start from scratch again. That's actually fine for things like, say, a job tracker or similar, where you may as well start and rebuild all your complicated state in your application master from scratch. What we were doing, we're trying to have long-lived services. We actually wanted to keep things running. The point being, if, say, for example, we're running HBase or Storm, if our app master fails, we don't want HBase to go down. We want the Storm session to keep running. So there is a new feature that my colleagues put in where we can say, set a flag called set to keep containers across application attempts, nice and short. Um, well, at least it does say what it does, you know, it's in its favor. And effectively what happens is the containers keep running. When your AM gets restarted, it gets given a list back of what containers come in, of what containers you already had. And you even get told what containers failed while you were down. If anyone's going to implement this, I think there's yarn people in the corner, if you're going to do that, synchronize everything, because it turns out you actually end up getting those failure callbacks before you've finished processing the answer. But effectively, you get this, and you've got to try and rebuild your state. And that's, that's an interesting problem. If you're going to do that, you've got to think, where do I keep my state that, that's persistent? We keep some of the stuff in HGFS. We have the kind of the original what it is we want, and we keep a history of where things are. If you've got anything else, I'd say look at Zookeeper. But of course, you cannot keep this in one of those Zookeeper ephemeral nodes, because once your RAM goes down, all its state goes away. So there's one other hack we actually do here, which is we, we use the single field in a yarn container, its priority for when you allocate it as a, as a single index into what kind of role a container has in the cluster. So we have different roles here, like a master, like a worker, like a monitor, like a, a garbage collector. We would give them four different priorities, one, two, three, four. And all we have to do is enumerate that cluster and see what they are. We've gone a bit beyond that now, where actually the code inside has a bit of minimal state. So what we're going to have to do is ask them where they think they are, whether they are, say, running or not running. And if they're, if they're not running, we just destroy them. We don't bother to worry about why they're running or what's on. But if they, if they are running, we just leave them alone. Anyway, it is, it's an interesting feature if you're running long-lived code. If you're not running long-lived applications, I would just say don't go near this. All right? It's just extra pain and suffering. And the real problem is rebuilding your state on a failure. And that's important because you have enough to do. And the extra thing you have to do is actually testing. Um, I'm a big fan of testing. I like writing tests. I think everyone should write more tests. I don't like waiting for tests to finish. 
Uh, that's where you can spend a lot of my life, is actually spent waiting for tests to finish these days. So like I said before, we move all application state into unit tests, and that's really nice because they, they finish in about five minutes. Where it gets harder is actually the real production tests. In this world, you actually want to simulate a yarn cluster. You want your programs to be downloaded from HGFS. You want to talk to HGFS. You want to exec things. You want to get the errors back. And there are, there's one thing that can help you here. is something called mini yarn cluster. It's a little class that actually runs all the yarn cluster inside your JVM process. So you can actually host the the resource manager, the node manager, they're all running in process. You can also bring up HGFS alongside that with a mini HGFS cluster, which I would not recommend doing at first, because when your test runs, HGFS gets taken away, and any interesting logs and other data you've collected goes away too. So it just run locally. I only discovered recently, because I hadn't read the guide properly enough, there's something called an unmanaged application master as well, which actually runs your application master in, in your JUnit code. I, I've not played with that, but I think it sounds like it would have made my life a lot easier. As it is, a lot of our simple tests are in the mini yarn cluster. It's nice, it works for simple tests, but as every, every test class starts that cluster up, and tears it down, it makes your application slower and slower and slower. So nowadays, what we're actually doing for most of our work is we're actually, we've designed it all to run functionally against real Hadoop clusters, starting at VMs. So we have a whole test suite, which actually, where our build process works is we build our binaries, we build our archive, a tarball, we untar it, then our functional test suite actually execs the binary script as you would real, real client applications, pointed at some settings files that dictates the real clusters. Locally, I run VMs, but we can run it against production clusters too, whether they're things on EC2 and Rackspace, or whether they're actually real physical clusters over SSH channels. It's notable here that I actually have three VMs, a Red Hat machine with Hadoop 2.4, Ubuntu 12, Java 8, last basically up-to-date branch 2 and Kerberos, with a little Windows thing in the corner that I go near sometimes. That's enough to pretty much create most of the configuration problems and grief you're going to encounter, and particularly Kerberos and Hadoop security. Hands up who's got a Kerberos in, in your enabled secure, secure Hadoop cluster. OK, keep your hands up if you like it. OK, one person at the back. It does actually make sense, and I would recommend everybody Stop being scared of Kerberos and learn to understand it, all right? It's just painful, but one, well, it actually does make sense in its own way. But it, it, it creates problems. It creates problems with long-lived services. It creates extra work in your tests, and it creates lots of interesting, obscure messages. A good one being I updated my cluster last week with app get update, and everything stopped working, and it turned out that there was a new Java 8 update, which then got installed by Ubuntu, which had not included the latest US-enabled encryption mechanism, so I could handle long, secure keys, which was then causing the client to fail with some error message, like couldn't talk to the server. You know, things like that. So that's why I'd recommend you start playing with this stuff sooner rather than later, is because you want that pain before it ships. Anyway, so testing. Testing is one of the areas where we really need to do a lot more work. I think it would be good if someone, and it might actually be me, sits down and writes a better test framework for this stuff. I also think actually testing large-scale distributed systems is probably harder than actually writing them in the first place. It's relatively easy to write an application that runs across 100 machines. It's a lot harder to show it worked. And that's effectively what testing is doing, is trying to show your code worked across a big cluster. And given that it doesn't, for the first few months of its life or whatever, trying to get the logs back and trying to help you understand why it failed. You know, and we're, we're, you know, we're still in the dark ages. We're still using log statements. You know, and that's basically printf for a, a thousand machines. So testing is fun. If you really want to work on it, come and find me. And that's not just in Horton Works, but if you're writing yarn clusters, write test frameworks and share them. So key point, 
Try and avoid doing as much of the work yourself, okay? Application masters are complicated, and the best way to avoid doing them is to let somebody else do all the heavy lifting. There are various people, projects working on things like this. I'm working on this slider stuff to run existing apps. Colleagues are doing Tez, that's a pipeline thing. If you ever read the Microsoft Dryad paper, you'll understand what they're doing there. And there are, there are other things going along the top. Apache Twill is going to be spoken about next, and I'm going to give a quick demo of it here. So Twill is probably the simplest way to run a Yarn application, where it takes a normal, what pretty much looks like a normal Java runnable, and runs it elsewhere. So this is me launching a, a Yarn application master. This is the client code. I basically say, create some Twill things, create an instance of my render class, and something locally to catch the logs, and then just run it. And that runs, that runs in the cluster. So this is what I'm about to demo. I've got a little frame render app, which will take some, an image file and some parameters, and it will render, render a frame. The nice thing about it is it scales well. It's the opposite of MapReduce, because it goes from a small file, it goes normal MapReduce is big inputs, small output. This goes to small input, massive output. You can be generating gigabytes a second if you've got a big, busy cluster. And so it changes the whole notion of where you want to place things. And, you know, and generally, you're, just, you're scheduling in failure mode. The nice thing is you can restart anything that fails. You want to place things so that time, consecutive frames are close to each other, so that if your next step is actually merging frames into a video, everything's reasonably local. Anyway, this is my demo. The code is online. And this is where we actually have a piece of code. This is the runner. I'm going to find the string here. Show it's not a rig demo. I want somebody in the audience to come up with a sentence, you. Come up with a phrase to say. Developers sleep less. Developers sleep less, OK. Everybody saw that was what my person that I'd given this quote to earlier said. Developers sleep less, OK. Right. Let's bring up my terminal window. This is me running a mini yarn cluster test here. So it's starting up the cluster in process. It's running on the local machine. If I bring up a separate window, I can do it, see what Java processes are running. And it will tell me, it might tell me what's happening. GPS. Twill launch is running. Okay, so that, that's, that's my application master running there. Okay, or, yeah, so that, that's running my code. This is still busy running away. This is all log junk that comes out of the Yarn application master and node managers. It is all generally meaningless until you're trying to find out why your code doesn't work. And then you will start end up learning to understand this stuff. Okay, just, just an observation, okay? Now, here we go. Developers sleep less. See, so that was me. That was me. That was a Yarn application running there locally to open a JPEG, render some text over it, and then save it again to and from a file system, be it local or do. And that was all it took. So even though I've been scaring people with all this stuff about how it's hard and painful and the rest of it, the point is, is you can write applications that run on a Yarn cluster. That was me rendering one frame locally. But if I extend that a bit to take things like different text, different frames, I could run that over 20, 30 nodes and generate real videos. Uh, anyway, that's what the renderer looks like, actually. I run, I've got a normal runnable, I get a context, I get my application arguments on the command line passed in. I just create my little renderer code here, run it and save it, and that's it. It's a runnable. It's not doing anything complicated at all. So, there you go, yarn. We, now, we can now let you run whatever you want inside the cluster. It hides a lot of the details, a lot of the LAN port layer in below, but it still takes work. Okay, you have to start handling policies of placement and failure handling. You have to deal with building up those command lines and executing it. So my main recommendation is find someone else to do the work. Okay, that's the, in fact, that's the secret of software engineering in general, is find a volunteer. And those people that put their hands up, they are the volunteers. Uh, especially whoever's talking on Twill next, they should be someone you should particularly listening to. Because really, what you want to think about is what algorithms are you going to run? 
not how do I integrate with Yarn, but what is my code going to do? What is the high-level stuff? What do I want to do to process data, to generate data, to do useful things, rather than what do I need to do to integrate with the system? And that, that's what you have to go home and do now. And we have a very short amount of time for questions. Five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, you say with Slider you can run arbitrary code. Has anyone tried running uh, uh, something like Tomcat? Right, question there was with Slider you can run arbitrary code. Um, that is the goal of Slider, we can let you run arbitrary code, okay? All right. What we're effectively doing there is we've got a new package format that you put things in there with various metadata saying, here are the parameters you have to do to help build up and execute the script. We've got some Python scripts to do launching and some templates and things like that. Yeah, people, we have played with Tomcat. We're doing HBase, Accumulo, and Storm first. And we're an Apache incubator project, which I would encourage you to get involved in if you can. One of the things about Tomcat and that is the goal is to let you run existing application as HGFS with saying, you know, the nice idea of the application is saying, Tomcat talking to HBase, with my client applications talking to Tomcat. Well, you've got to do a lot of dynamic binding there, actually. You don't know where Tomcat's going to be, what ports is going to be until it's running and that. So one of the things I've been doing a lot of work on is service registries and getting configurations. So after we deploy Tomcat, we have to provide binding information so that Tomcat clients can work out what's going on. So I've been doing lots of service registry stuff. I'm going to be implementing a chunk of that in Yarn later on this summer, actually, Yarn 896. If you like service registries, get involved. OK, another question? Over there, Stefan. Stefan is one of the people who volunteered. He's doing Stratosphere. He will gladly field your support calls. Stefan. Um, how fast would you say can Yarn in its current architecture get to, you know, bring up an application master? Given that the application master starts really fast, allocates a handful of containers, Okay. How fast can that get? What, what, what delay does Yarn add on whatever delay your application has? Okay, the question is, what is the startup delay? Well, your application starts. Okay, there's the overhead to download the binaries, which is why we're doing some caching thing. And then there is the problem of just telling the node manager what it is to have to run. Node managers report in, they heartbeat in, and that's when they get given the work. Yarn can start the most up if it allocates as many containers in one go. Um, and then when, and that, that startup delay, that heartbeat can, can slow things down. The problem being the bigger the cluster, the longer that heartbeat has to be. You, in a small cluster, you can just say report in faster. As you get bigger, you have to make them slower. The good news is also that node managers report in whenever they finish work. So if you've got a cluster that's busy doing analytics applications where containers finish rapidly, then node managers report in more, which generates more space. A bigger issue is in a big cluster that's busy, you're not going to get space for the containers, especially if you start asking for lots of memory and lots of CPU. You're not going to get compute time because other people are using it. Does that answer your question? OK. OK, so, so Yarn is pushing out work in response to heartbeats. It's pretty much doing it like Hadoop used to do, right? Yeah, so, I believe so. Um, in contrast, let's say systems like, like Spark and Stratosphere try and eagerly push out work from the, from the masters to the workers, which, which does get down the deployment latency. Yeah, I mean, if you actually look at the trend, one of the things is we're going towards away from classic map reducers towards session-based things. So Storm and Tez and that, they bring up a set of containers that hang around for a while. And that stops you having this workflow saying, bring up a lot of containers, tear them down, requeue stuff, bring them up again. So it's just... If, you can, if your application master can bring up a pool of containers and hang on to them, you can then do a lot of productive work and push work out to them however you want. Zookeeper being a good example, you can just push things into Zookeeper saying, do this. And as the information gets picked up by watchers, the client nodes in the watchers, they can pick things up. And I actually think that's how Twill does stuff, actually. They use Zookeeper a lot there. OK? Just uh, how, does, how does Yarn compare with Mesos? That is a good question. How does Yarn compare with Mesos? I'm not entirely sure. I haven't played enough with Mesos. I know Mesos has come out saying we are purely an execution framework. Yarn is an evolution of more the MapReduce world. So I know Yarn is very good at running 
short to medium lived services applications and analysis jobs. And it has that integral notion of data aware placement. You want to run your code near the data. Where, where Yar, uh, I don't think Mesos is so good at that, but Mesos is better at long lived applications, which is where Yarn is weaker. So we're pushing Yarn, I'm kind of leading in some of the work and saying, let's make Yarn better at hosting long lived applications. I think at Mesos they're going to have the other way, saying, okay, let, let's, let's handle short lived applications better. Okay. More questions? Then thank you very much. Okay.